we, the second and last speaker of this uh, session is Renata Kalish. Uh, hi, Renata. Uh, who's going to talk to us on quantization of gravity in the black hole background. So please go ahead. Can you see my screen? Uh, yes. Uh, yeah. First slide. Okay. So uh, I'm happy to be here again with my friends from Moscow and everywhere. And thank you very much for the invitation. And uh, it is a pleasure to give a talk dedicated to Andrei Dmitrievich Sakharov. And everybody who knew him remembers him as a great inspiration in our life. And so I'll just proceed with my talk then, uh, which is a very recent paper with Stanford student Adel Rahman, which happened to be a student of Bob Wald in Chicago <laughs> before that. Uh, and so he just came to graduate school here at Stanford. And the topic is quantization of gravity in the black hole background. And the story is uh, that um, we consider um, Reggie Wheeler setup, which means that uh, the background in which we will define the Feynman integral, and this is the meaning of quantization, which apparently during this um, conference, many people use the term quantization of gravity in different uh, setting. So the one which I discuss is just the very simple story that because in gravity we have gauge symmetry, the path integral is not well defined unless we do something. And so in Reggie Wheeler uh, story, which goes many years back, um, it turns out that nobody done this work, uh, which we did now. So we take a Lagrangian and we uh, perform, we choose a gauge, which is a Reggie gauge for harmonics, uh, which are, which starts with quadrupoles. And because of our background being a Schwarzschild space time, we have a natural split of the four dimensional space into two dimensional space and the sphere. Now it turns out that low multiples cause a problem. And in fact, it remains not totally noticed that um, Reggie Wheeler gauge is actually not valid for low multiples. And uh, there were some uh, proposals how to deal with this in various papers, but we will propose a background covariant gauge for monopoles and dipoles so that they are well defined in perturbative quantum gravity. And we will find uh, something that uh, for all um, harmonics above one, Fadeev Popov ghosts are not propagating. However, for monopoles and dipoles, we will find that in general, those ghosts are there. On the other hand, it was quite amazing to observe that if we go to Schwarzschild coordinates, uh, all time derivatives drop and the monopoles and dipole goes have instantaneous propagators, uh, which we're familiar with from uh, QCD quantization and Coulomb gauge. And so the final statement, which I'll uh, try to bring you to is that um, if we just follow the status of uh, Fadeev theorem, which however was um, of course derived uh, not in a context of space which has a horizon. But still, uh, we will uh, come to conclusion that it is quite likely that there is a canonical Hamiltonian quantization with ghost-free Hilbert space. So uh, first of all, let me compare something which uh, is important here that once you have a theory which with gauge symmetries, you can define the path integral either by performing Hamiltonian quantization or Lagrangian quantization. There's, the procedures are different. So the Hamiltonian one is known to be fundamental because it is our understanding, path to understanding the uh, issue of physical states as well as unitarity. On the other hand, covariant Lagrangian quantization 
is definitely simpler. It is manifestly independent of the choice of gauge fixing condition and choice of coordinates. Therefore, we did precisely this one, but it kind of opened the door to a very interesting situation with the Hamiltonian. So the, the main uh, work on which our work is based are due to Fadiev, Fratkin, Tutin, and Fratkin, Batalin, and Volkovsky. And so what we can deduce now, looking carefully at these results, is that Hamiltonian quantization gives the same results for gravitational observable as the Lagrangian quantization under certain conditions. And there are two types of gauge fixing conditions because we are dealing with background, uh, background field method. So one correspond to the case of unitary ghost free Hamiltonians in gauge theory and Hilbert space of state has a definite metric. And the other case is when we have something which is known as pseudo unitary Hamiltonian. The S matrix is pseudo unitary in the Hilbert space, which has indefinite metric. And I'll have more details on this. So what we have done so far in this program, we have performed covariant Lagrangian quantization of gravity in the black hole background. So the uh, gauge which we are using is Regeviller gauge for L uh, for a partial wave greater than one. And we have a new class of gauges for uh, L uh, zero and one because Regeviller gauge is actually not valid. And we found evidence, which I'll present, that the can canonical Hamiltonian, when constructed, will belong to a class of unitary ghost free Hamiltonians in our gauge, the one which is here. So um, the, the standard reason why we need to define a Feynman pass integral in, this, in the situation where uh, the integration over perturbation uh, is badly defined because we have gauge symmetries. And so already in 69, uh, Fadeev Popov uh, designed covariant Lagrangian quantization in the background field method. And so the first thing is to decide on the choice of constraints which are associated with gauge fixing condition. And they depend both on the background metric, which in our case will be Schwarzschild solution, as well as on perturbation. And once we decided uh, about this choice, the well-defined perturbatively well-defined well pass integral, which basically gives us the rule for Feynman diagrams, involves the following. First, we have a classical action as usual. Then we have a delta function for our choice of gauge fixing condition. And the most important thing here, we have this Jacobian, which is designed to make this pass integral independent on the choice of gauge fixing condition. So if we choose, if we change this function, the Jacobian is such that the change is uh, taken care. And so the way this Jacobian is defined is by the variation of the gauge fixing function under gauge symmetry. So delta of this function of, um, uh, of perturbation over which I integrate and the background field is given by a certain in general differential operator, which depends on uh, background metric as well as on perturbation. And so the answer is, that this determinant here is exponent trace of log of this uh, operator. And uh, according to this great discovery of Fadeev and Popov, this Jacobian can be presented with the help of anti-commuting Fadeev Popov ghosts. So instead of writing it in this form, we can present it as an integral over anti-ghost and ghost from the exponent, which has C bar alpha, which is anti-ghost. It has this differential operator, which depends on background as well as on perturbation and the ghost field. So this is the short story that uh, to define the pass integral where the Feynman rules are well uh, defined at every order in perturbation theory, this is the recipe. 
And the question is, how do we make this choice and what it means? So specifically, in more modern language, people use what is known as Becky-Ruestera-Tutin and Fratkin, Vasilin, uh, Fratkin Batalin Volkovsky quantization. And the action consists of classical action, which depends on the combination of background field and perturbation. It consists of certain choice of gauge fixing and Fadev Popov ghosts. These three are required. And the choice of gauge fixing comes with Lagrange multiplier. So if we integrate B out, we will get the delta function of our constraint, which I showed you before. And for the pop of ghosts are given precisely by the general formula before, where the variation of chi, uh, we differentiate it over H, and the variation of the H is just the uh, gauge symmetry transformation, where the parameter uh, is replaced by the ghost. So it is conceptually extremely simple uh, story. If I change this function chi, then uh, my pass integral uh, remains the same for physical observables. And so we get the same pass integral as in David Fadeev Popov method at the previous slide. So we integrate over gravitational perturbation over the uh, Lagrange multiplier to gauge fixing over anti ghost and ghost, and we take this. BRST action, and we get the answer, which is gauge independent. So our purpose is to construct this uh, David Fadeev Popov Feynman integral and the corresponding BRST action for gravity in the black hole background in Reggie Wheeler's setup with expansion of gravitational perturbation in spherical harmonics. And uh, of course, uh, this could have been done any time after uh, 1967 because the procedure was known. And so the question is, why now? And the answer is the following. Uh, Reggie Wheeler have written their paper, Bing and Leiden, in 1957. And they called it stability of Schwarzschild singularity. They considered first order perturbation to classical solution. There's an interesting story that for, for 40 years, nobody cared a lot. Then there was gradual interest raising here. By, uh, by the time there was a discovery of gravitational waves from black hole mergers, there was a significant decrease, uh, sorry, increase. And then of course, uh, COVID came. And this is what we see here. Uh, for me, uh, personally, I didn't know about Reggie Wheeler gauge, uh, but there was a paper by Tooft and collaborators very recently, and they, they gave a list of short comments of their paper. And uh, in this list, they told they don't know uh, what are Fadeev Popov ghost action in the Reggie Wheeler gauge, and therefore it was natural to supply this information. And in the process, we have found it's just a very interesting problem, no matter what. Also, Tooft had long this idea that black hole microstates somehow should be associated with partial waves. This is, of course, first, uh, first quantization. Anyway, just an example, how we usually do the perturbative computation in gravity. Most often, we use something known as background covariant the Donder gauge, where this derivative is derivative of the perturbation in the background metric. And uh, so this is the well-known story of Adev Popov ghosts are extremely important. Their propagator is the box and they give important contribution. Many people were working on this uh, topic and they did the computation. And so this is the uh, background covering the Donder gauge where ghosts are really important. The other interesting gauge which exists in gravity was designed by Dirac in 1959. And it was, uh, uh, the canonical quantization was performed by Fratkin, Tutin, Fadeev, Popov around 70. And the gauge is here in front of your eyes. And it is, there is no background here. And what is known uh, that this gauge has a unitarizing ghost-free Hamiltonian. Uh, 
which to the best of my knowledge was never actually presented, but it is kind of inexplicitly known. And, but what is known for analogous situation in Coulomb gauge in Young Mills, and it was Arkady Weinstein, who I think is here, who explained to me the situation that in Coulomb gauge in Young Mills, which very much like Dirac gauge in gravity, kinetic terms uh, of uh, Fadeev Popov ghosts are known to have, sorry, instead of simultaneous, it should have been instantaneous ghost propagators. There are only space-time derivatives. And this is the feature which is uh, known that um, as a result, the ghost loops with instantaneous propagator are canceled by loops of instantaneous part of gluon. And therefore they are totally equivalent to Hamiltonian perturbative rules where there are no ghosts because it's a unitary Hamiltonian. And it looks like what we see here in gravity will come out exactly like that. Okay, so here is a reminder, what is this Reggie Wheeler setup? And people who worked on it, whose work we were using and expertise are Zerilli and uh, uh, Martel and Poisson. And Eric Poisson was extremely helpful in explaining to us uh, the issues. So we split the four dimensional space into M2 and S2. This is obviously a split of the metric. We have 2D geometry where we have the metric covariant derivative, the volume form. We define certain objects which are derivative of R and uh, R is defined globally. And we have TA. And so this is our metric and the epsilon tensor. And this is of course the F which enters in the metric. And because there is a work factor and there are cross terms in Christoffel's. So the four dimensional derivative consists of two dimensional and the other two dimensional derivative. Uh, and there are certain mixed Christoffel. So it is almost 2D gravity. Therefore, each field, which I'll present in Reggie Wheeler's setup at the next slide, will be a function of just these two coordinates, X1 and X2, which can be chosen in any way, Schwarzschild, Kruskal, whatever. But, um, what is important that every field will, have, will carry an index LM, which is a remnant of the fact that there was this sphere. So here we go. We use this decomposition to spherical harmonic uh, like that. And this is the uh, Reggie Wheeler ansatz. They take this um, four by four uh, H menu and present it in terms of parity even and parity odd in, in this, on the sphere objects. And here is their ansatz. So if you look carefully, you will see that um, every uh, coefficient has a specific L and M, which depend only on 2D coordinates, which is like almost two dimensional, but still not quite. There are 10 functions of X1 and X2, H, A, B, with indices LM, GA. So this is one 2D tensor, uh, uh, two vectors, GA and HA, and three scalars, K and G and H2. And so we have seven, uh, uh, seven fields, two dimensional fields in even sector and three in odd. And then the same happens with gauge symmetries. Instead of four dimensional Xi mu, we have parity even and parity odd, and we have the split. And so as a result, here is the story. We have gauge transformations, uh, which was um, again, a reminder that they are not quite two dimensional metric, but the deviation from two dimension is only due to mixed Christoffels. And so we have this as a four dimensional derivative this is a two dimensional derivative and this is the other two dimensional derivative. And so the even sector consists of certain transformations as well as odd sector. And now uh, the choice of uh, Reggie and Wheeler was to pick up these uh, four functions to vanish. Now that we know the gauge symmetries and we know the choice of a gauge, it's a straightforward exercise to provide the ghost action. Here it is. And there is some 
nonlinear terms, but as you see, there are no propagation at all. So all these ghosts are simply irrelevant. They drop. And this is a reminder of, of what is standard model in unitary gauge. When you say that Goldstone bosons are absent, your gauge fixing condition is here. And then you compute your ghost action and it is just a product of anti-ghost on ghost, no derivative, no propagation. And therefore, this is the unitary gauge. So the story with this gauge is the main problem when we go to law uh, multiples, because at L equals zero, this function is absent, this function is absent, and this function is absent, so we have to do something else. And some of these functions are also absent at, uh, for dipoles. And so uh, the reason why the, these functions are absent, why Reggie Wheeler is not valid for low multiple is very simple because some of the fields are contracted with higher harmonics, which are absent in uh, L0 and 1. And also the same happens with number of gauge symmetries. They're different for low monopoles. Here is the list of all gauge symmetries and there is a different list. And so this gauge as devised by Reggie Wheeler is not valid for dipoles, even in odd and monopoles. And we have uh, found after a number of attempts, something which looked uh, a reasonable gauge and the advantage of this gauge where we take K and G A zero or R A H A zero. And here we have a pseudoscalar T A R B that this choice is to D background covariant and therefore it allowed us a full uh, gauge invariant analysis. And so here is the, uh, the answer is we know what the gauge uh, fixing action has to be. This is the uh, action. I will uh, continue, I understand my time is soon out. And so I will quickly show you that after a bit of manipulation with all of this, we got all the, that all ghosts in Reggie Wheeler gauge are not propagating, which is good news. However, with, um, uh, with uh, dipoles and monopoles, the situation is the following. You, what you see in yellow is the final version of this action. And we do have some derivatives and therefore a priori, we have no way to say that they decouple or what. But a wonderful uh, story was that once we looked at this in Schwarzschild coordinates, all time derivative drop. And the, what you see in green, you see that either there are no derivatives or there are only derivative in space direction. And this is a very nice uh, situation, totally unexpected and we didn't know why. But the fact is the situation totally reminds uh, the story of the Coulomb gauge with instantaneous um, propagators in covariant quantization. And now I will just remind you what is the story when we have gauge symmetries. We then rewrite our Lagrangian through the Hamiltonian form with constraints in general. Then to make a canonical quantization, we have these two choices I started with. One choice when our condition depends only on P and Q and the Hamiltonian depends on certain choice of P star and Q star, not directly related to it. There is a procedure where the number of physical degrees of freedom goes from one to N minus M. Or the other choice is where the gauge fixing condition involves also Lagrange multiplier and especially their time derivative. And in this choice, it is also known how to build the Hamiltonian, but it certainly contains degrees of freedom associated with uh, ghosts which have a negative, uh, they are anti-commuting. Therefore, um, uh, the observation is that in general, what we have found that when we are in Schwarzschild coordinates, when there are no time derivative acting on ghosts, therefore the canonical quantization is expected uh, 
to be uh, without canonical degrees of freedom associated with ghosts. And therefore, it is most likely that we will find unitary ghost-free Hamiltonian. Now, so far, we didn't study, of course, Eddington and Finkelstein and Kruskal Secker's coordinates, where at least there is no problem with the horizon. This has to be done. So what is the Fideo theorem uh, telling us? That if you go from Hamiltonian form, you have certain Poisson bracket, such that basically it predicts that in the Hamiltonian form, you will have, in general, some uh, instantaneous ghost propagators. And so we checked it. And it was really amazing to see how beautiful is the agreement. So we computed the Poisson brackets and this type of expressions. And in general, as you see, there are derivatives here. However, we go to Schwarzschild and we have only derivatives in space and no derivatives in time. And this is for uh, also for uh, monopoles, same story. In general, you have derivatives over time here, but it drops from determinant. And so time derivatives are gone. And then even, even uh, monopoles and dipoles have only instantaneous propagators. And so the canonical quantization of gravity was not performed. Uh, what is known is only in Minkowski space. Now that we have singular horizon, this is an extra new problem to, uh, to address. But according to Fadeev theorem, which is valid in the flat background, the ghost-free unitary Hamiltonian exists in the class of gauges, which we studied here. And uh, this is the, uh, my final slide. I think I am in time. So the, in conclusion, we have found that in covariant quantization in Schwarzschild coordinates, there is no time derivative acting on ghosts. And such a Hamiltonian, which we believe can be explicitly constructed, and we expect that it will belong to unitary ghost-free Hamiltonian. And the reason for this is that the other option of pseudo-unitary Hamiltonian would contradict to our observation that there were no time derivative on ghosts. Therefore, this uh, Hilbert space with um, a negative with states of negative metric is not expected. And to finalize my uh, talk, I would like to stress that um, we have not studied yet uh, other coordinates where the uh, horizon is not singular, the situation will be different. And uh, although we have performed a covariant quantization in any of these coordinates, so we do have answer for any coordinate, but to study the issue of unitarity and how to quantize, we have to make a choice of time coordinates. And this is the very interesting story, which is still ahead of us. Thank you. Hey. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, so we have time for questions and uh, Alexander Vick, oh, I'm sorry, Arkady Weinstein is the first on the raised hand list. So please go ahead. Uh, uh, hi, Renata, thanks for hey. the talk. I, I'm just trying to, uh, to check my understanding, you know, to follow what you said, that uh, particular, my, my, I, uh, I believe that what you are saying is that essentially, uh, in principle, uh, you, are, uh, you can follow up the program of kind of normal unitary quantization, right, with Hamiltonian, with no cost, right, in, in, this, in this case, or uh, is it so correct? Here is what I expect will happen. Yeah. That, uh, in, uh, for all modes, starting from quadruples, there is no issue. I'm sure there is a Hamiltonian, which is a unitary one. But the dipoles and monopoles, which are uh, known also to, to have no radiative modes, but they're uh, difficult in this context of Feynman pass integral. So our preliminary understanding that it would be exactly as uh, in the case of Hriplovich first observation that in the unitary Hamiltonian, even for monopoles, and dipoles, we will see the same situation as in the Coulomb gauge. The Hamiltonian has no ghosts. However, when we go to Lagrangian quantization, both 
the ghost as well as corresponding uh, modes of um, gravitational perturbation will have these instantaneous propagators. However, they expect to cancel because they are not present in the Hamiltonian form. So this yeah, is no. an expectation. Yeah, no, I understand. Yeah, so, so in this sense, I, no, I still would call that uh, you still have Hamiltonian uh, uh, without ghost, but you can relate it as a Lagrangian with uh, this uh, uh, ghost, which are only in space, right? Uh, this yes. I got it. Uh, but I wonder when you talk about this uh, monopole and dipole, right? Then uh, and says that uh, this gauge condition does not uh, fix, uh, you know, there does it imply that there is uh, some extra um, uh, condition you, you should push, put for those modes, uh, monopole and, and, and dipole? Or... We, did. we did. So, uh, what people didn't notice in the past, that Regevier mm -hmm. condition doesn't specify the monopoles and dipoles. But yeah. uh, various people did these studies. We just used the background covariant gauge fixing. So this this yeah, part so, so of it, is, it is solved. Yeah, so I see. So there is additional kind, and uh, I, I was also wondering about counting because at the end of the day, uh, you know, kind of number of conditions should correspond that say like number of polarization is two, whatever. So you can exactly. check also. so. Yeah. Exactly. So my preliminary studies of the Hamiltonian perfectly support this. We'll have exactly two degrees of freedom everybody expect. But the, the dependence on, um, on spherical harmonics is quite nice. But okay. this has to be checked yet. Okay. Yes. Th thank you. Yeah, it's very, very, thanks for the talk. Sure. Okay, uh, Alexander Wickman is next. Uh, th thanks a lot for the talk. I, I learned, I think, a lot. Uh, by the way, is there any way to connect it or to map it into, let's say, the sitter, especially the sitter in a static patch? Well, um, I would say that um, this kind of consideration, I certainly hope, uh, is just the very first approach to the problem because, uh, yes, I, yeah, I would say it is like my feeling is that there are many more things one can do. Uh, starting uh, starting from there, yes. But this is very recent. As you see, it was posted a couple of days ago. And it was very hard to work at, uh, at COVID time with the students. I have never seen the student I worked with, except, of course, on, on Zoom. But there will, there will be things to do here, I believe. Great, great, thanks a lot. Okay, um, Philip Stamp has messaged me that he keeps putting his hand up, but it disappears. So I'll call on him and then uh, Andre and Igor after that. So Philip, go ahead. Uh, thank you, uh, Bob. Uh, I found this to be an extraordinarily beautiful talk, um, uh, but I, and I'm aware that the question I'm gonna ask may open a can of worms, but I wanted to know what your opinion was on uh, generalizing this work to a Kerr metric. Oh yeah, that is a, exactly the point. You see, the uh, according to Zerilli and Poisson, who studied Regeviller's story, uh, the uh, contribution from dipoles can be uh, treated as small addition of the rotation if there was a particle surrounding the black hole with certain angular momentum. And if you solve, instead of homogeneous equation, you solve the equation with the source. And this is a part which is quite intriguing. On the other hand, Regeviller is so much based on spherical symmetry yeah. that it, it, it needs to be generalized in a way which have not done been, have not been done, or at least I may not know, maybe, because the story goes back to 57. Maybe some people did it also for a background of Kerr black holes. I will not be surprised. I just don't know. But it is my feeling that now that we are trying to understand gravity more and more, uh, Reggie Wheeler's story is a good beginning. I have a feeling that Saul Tukolsky might have done a generalization. Yes. I'd have to look it up. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I had no time to look through all of this. I talked to Eric Poisson, who worked on this, and he helped me to understand the part of the gravity which I was not aware of. And 
Of course, it is between two chairs. So quantization is not what people in GR do, but now we have to learn from each other and see how far we can go. Thank you very much. Welcome. Okay, uh, Andre. Oh, you're muted. Okay. A very, very interesting talk and very interesting results. And I just wanted to ask a number of questions uh, just to, to understand whether I correctly understand what, what, is, uh, what do you suggest. Um, is it right that um, your <clears throat> uh, that you have calculated, uh, actually obtained the fadiev popov determinant, not the determinant, but the operator itself, globally yes. the full configuration space of uh, this of the gravity theory. Yes. And I understand it is, uh, uh, well, at least uh, what you wrote, what you showed to us, it is invertible. Oh yeah, of course. Otherwise I would not call it permissible. Yes, of course it is a gauge fixing permissible no. in perturbative gravity. Yes, it is invertible. And so this is exact and it is globally non-degenerate on the full configuration space of metrics. Oh, 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 this is a beautiful question. You know, we had, I had a fir first version of the article in December about to post it, but then we have realized that the monopoles and dipoles are really hard. And so we need another five months to understand it better. And part of it had to do with the something which in literature is known as extra degeneracy. So if you allow yourself a change of coordinates with uh, boundary conditions at R such that the uh, gauge symmetries or change of coordinates is not vanishing at big R or even growing, then you observe that for monopoles and dipoles, those gauge fixing conditions are not unique. But of course, when we define pass integral, we follow the rules. And of course, Bob Wald knows it more than anybody else because he taught his student, and his student taught me that you, once you restrict yourself with gauge symmetries, which are gauge symmetries, which we consider, which should fall off at infinity. Otherwise we don't have word identities and other things. Then those gauges become totally well-defined. And this is a very beautiful part of the story. So if you expect difficulties, then these difficulties are only in this finite dimensional sector of- uh, yeah, 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 yeah. But I think we resolve them, yeah. Everything about uh, um, monopoles and dipoles was difficult, but I think we understand it now, significant extent. So does it mean actually that you are ready to claim such a uh, major, major statement that you uh, don't have uh, analog of gribov copies problem in gravity oh, 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 no, 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 no. Here is where Arkady will not allow me to yeah. mess up. Okay. Gribov story goes beyond perturbative uh, QCD. Same here. If you, if you allow yourself uh, non-perturbative um, analysis, then all bets are off. It's a different story then. No, but just a moment. The problem of grip of copies, this is uh, the problem of invertibility of the fadiev popov determinant. Right. But it, the general, look, then it's right. Are, right. Okay, at the level of perturbative Feynman diagrams, QCD has no problem. The same here. At the level of non-perturbative where, where you have to go to lattice, etc., it's the same problem. Yes, it has to be studied. Uh, I see. Okay, one more technical uh, question, uh, if I can. Well, uh, actually, Andre, maybe I'll let me move on to the other people and come back to you since there have been a few uh, Igor Volovich has been waiting patiently for. Yeah, Andre quite some sent time. me email. We can continue on email. Well, we can. I'll go back to you, Andre. But let me let me get to the other people first. Uh, yeah, so thank you, Renato, for the nice talk. You look great. My question is concerning uh, time independence of 
goes. The same story for Minkowski background? That's a great question. Indeed. So uh, when we are working in arbitrary coordinates, like in Kruskal, I have no limit, right? Uh, however, in Schwarzschild coordinate, it appears that our quantization is remains valid in the flat background. However, instead of just using the standard, you know, um, the standard flat space, I really have to use the spherical coordinates. And it appears, although, so, so far we have not made a strong claim that the limit m going to zero, so the space has no horizon. It is just the Minkowski space in spherical coordinates. It appears that this quantization works well. Okay, very interesting. I thought the reason maybe simply there exists the killing vector field for both cases, Minkowski and Schwarzschild. Yeah, yeah I, I suspect that this quantization starting with, of course, Reggie Wheeler wanted to understand the black hole story, not the flat space. But it appears that at least in Schwarzschild coordinates, it might, the, the limit might be quite soft and maybe it will correspond to quantization in Minkowski space in spherical coordinates. Okay, thank you very much. Welcome. Okay, Alexei uh, Starbinsky. Okay, uh, I guess, uh, well, thank you. Uh, Renata for uh, this very interesting talk. My uh, remark is, um, uh, it's in fact a, a continuation of what was uh, shortly mentioned by uh, uh, Philip Stamp, that um, especially in the case of, of black holes, it is, I recommend you to use the uh, 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 in Newman Penrose method which just um, uh, uh, it leads to the Tarkovsky equations for for perturbations of any spin, in particular, in particular s equal to, but for um, uh, 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 I guess for in the pop of uh, it goes goes go, and when you obtain a rather elegant equation, uh, which can be solved in many interesting cases, in particular in the case of the, of the Kerr black hole, uh, black hole where exists another effect, additional to the Hotting one, um, a super radiance, and actually it was it was it was proved for for gravitational and electromagnetic waves in my uh, old paper with. Um, we have two, uh, two, uh, two uh, drill of in J in J T P in 1973. So once more, I think that the um, uh, uh, in in human panels um, uh, uh, formalism that will be the most effective in the case of 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 care black holes. I I suspect that something like that is bound to happen. And uh, the only thing I'm missing, because the references are during so many years uh, back, maybe you can send me references. I will be very Once grateful. more, as I said, Renate, it's my 1973 uh, paper in GTP. In GHAP. OK. No, no. Uh, so in... Jet. Oh, Jet. Oh, I see. Yeah, good. So this is precisely what um, I would like to do. Now that we learned that there, are, there is more interest to black hole in general, in particular to quantization of gravity and to Hamiltonian. So the first thing I want to do the Hamiltonian for just Schwarzschild and, and then to include uh, much more interesting uh, black hole solutions. Thank you very much. Thanks, advantage of this equation, which actually can be used in the Schwarzschild case, case too. Once more, where they have the, uh, formally the same form for any spin, and so you may easily add as many as many for the uh, 
pop off ghosts as you as you wish. Well, what is interesting in the Schwarzschild case, we didn't know that there will be practically unitary gauge apart from those mono, uh, monopoles and dipoles. But even for monopoles and dipoles, it appears that we can get the unitarity. And it would be especially interesting in case of, uh, of uh, rotating. So we'll see what will happen. Lots of things to study, thank you. Okay, well, we're running a little over time, but let me go back to Andre for the last question and then we'll end the session. Well, <laughs> I'm afraid that this question will be very long, but uh, I will try to make it as concise as possible. So question is, uh, in this Reggio Wheeler parameterization of uh, all metric variables, uh, your gauge, well, not your gauge, but the uh, uh, Reggio Wheeler gauge, does it actually depend only on the canonical uh, variables sector of the, of the theory? Well, you know that uh, the whole sector, it is uh, phase space sector and Lagrange multipliers in canonical formula. Oh, okay, okay. So oh. here is the, uh, do, do you see my screen? Yeah, we can see your screen. Okay, yeah. so everything you have is HAB here, just classical fields so far. G, A, K, G, H A and H2, there are 10 functions, all classical. These are your H menu, 10 of them. But they are function of just two variables as well as they have the indices. And the gauge fixing condition is only in terms of, um, in terms of these functions. Okay. So the answer is no Lagrange multipliers. Everything depends on just uh, H menus. So no Lagrange multipliers no. at these, these gauges at all, yeah? This is precisely what I told you. This looks like a hint on unitarity because they're just simple functions of Q in this case, not even P. But then it is definitely, this is just by definition unitary gauge. Right, which is what nobody somehow noticed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Except except we still had to do some work. Now, this gauge is not valid in for low monopoles, but the one which I show you here, can you see? Now we had to choose a different set. Uh, they're all still just the fields, just each menus. Mm -hmm. Therefore, you would expect that this is unity. Not quite, because uh, let me show you Fadeev Popov, you see? for these low multiples, they're kind of bothering you. So you see this D, DA, and therefore you have time derivative a priori. Moreover, in Kruskal and in, um, in, in, uh, in, um, uh, in the advanced time coordinates, in VR coordinates, Eddington Finkelstein, things are not totally obvious. We simply had no time to understand. So it is not, here they are. You see the, the derivative accidentally in Schwarzschild, they drop, but there are time derivatives. So those low multiples are a bit um, requiring a lot of attention. On the other hand, it is my expectation that they will not bother us in the Hamiltonian level when uh, everything will be sorted out, but not yet. As far as I remember, this time derivative uh, is in the of diagonal uh, block of your triangular uh, Popov matrix, right? Right. So everything in the, is in the paper. And so we just follow the rule. We check the gauge symmetries. They're tricky for low multiples. But in the end, once you go to Schwarzschild, all time derivative drops. Mm -hmm. And I don't know more at this point, but I do hope to learn more. Very, very interesting, very interesting. Thank but you. I was so happy when I got the invitation from you. I was halfway with this paper. So I was hoping that I'll talk to people who will give me good advice. Thank you all.
the most remarkable result here, I think that this is a global, global properties of this uh, operator on the full uh, phase space of the theory. That it is uh, uh, yeah. one I vector of higher, higher multiples, yeah? Yeah, this is just, you know, two of them, zero and, and one. And starting with quadruples, everything else, infinite number of them. And what is interesting that zero and one are not part of radiation. So everybody who knows GR knows they're not, and as, as far as I see now, they will not be quantized degrees of freedom at all. They are outside of the physical sector. They are expressed in terms of other degrees of freedom, yeah. Yeah, one of them corrects black hole mass. This is a monopole. Classical solution is just a correction to black hole mass. Uh, one of the dipoles seem to be correcting the, uh, giving a, a small rotation. And the other is just gauge the way in a sense. So what I would like to say, the Ray Wheeler story turns out to be very interesting and it can be followed up in different directions. Okay, well, thank you very much for the talk. And uh, well, uh, thanks to Valeri too for his uh, talk. And uh, well, we've run over. I think uh, this would be the right time to end the session now.